1969, Beth Abraham Hospital in New York had a patient named Leonard. Leonard had not left the hospital in 30 years. He was one of a group of patients who had been there since before some of the nurses were even born. And they all suffered from a mysterious illness that had swept the country in the early 20th century. One that had left them in a, in a catatonic state, frozen inside their own bodies, like human statues. Nobody knew what was going on inside there. Were they conscious, unconscious, something in between? Or worst of all, were they wide awake, fully aware of what was going on around them and just unable to get their bodies to talk to their brains? Nobody knew. Then one day in March of 1969, Leonard and the others were going through their daily routines, you know, food, cleaning, medicine, when the doctor came in with an oral medicine for each of them to drink. Now, there was nothing unusual about this. They were always tweaking their medicines and the doctors were always testing different things to try to help their condition. Um, the nurses didn't even ask what it was, it was so routine. After Leonard got his medicine, they wheeled him into the rec room where the other patients were sat around TVs and stereos and whatnot. And after staring blankly at the TV for about a half an hour or so, Leonard woke up and he started to talk. Where had Leonard been this whole time? What was this sleeping sickness that had put him in this state? And what was the drug that got him out of it? And the most important question, could this happen again? I have talked in multiple videos at this point about the beginning of the 20th century and how quickly things were changing and evolving. It comes up a lot, actually. In fact, I think I, think I talked about it last week, but it really was a crazy time. I mean, just think about how many things happened in just a couple of decades. Like, people's homes got you know, gas lines, and then indoor plumbing, and then electricity. Radio became a thing, and then movies. Cars were invented, then airplanes. World War I brought untold devastation and killed 20 million people. Then the Spanish flu came through and killed 50 million more. Just to put that into perspective, the global population was around 1.6 billion at the time. So between World War I and the Spanish flu, nearly 5% of the world population was wiped away. So if you knew more than 20 people, you knew someone who died from one of those two things. But just as things were settling down and the world began to recover and prepare for a Great Depression and an even bigger World War II, somewhere in the middle of all that came one of the most bizarre and still unexplained global pandemics of all time. By the way, I should point out that I actually did cover this topic in an episode of my Mysteries of the Human Body series over on Nebula. Um, I'll go way more in depth on it in this video, but yeah, it was an episode on Mysterious Plague, so if you want to know more stories like this, you can go find them there. It all started in the winter of 1916 in Europe when patients began showing up in hospitals complaining of an extreme malaise, a total lack of energy, and an overwhelming desire to sleep. Some showed other neurological symptoms as well, like tremors and palsies and hyperkinetic movements. And in some extreme cases, patients were in basically a catatonic state, just almost comatose, unable to move or react to their environment. Luckily for most people, the disease ran its course and they just kind of went on with their lives. Although there was some ongoing neurological damage, we'll talk about that later. But for an unfortunate few, this became their permanent existence. And more of these cases seemed to pop up every day. The disease got the attention of a doctor from the Psychiatric Neurological Clinic of the University of Vienna, who had examined a handful of these patients with this disease, and he was the first doctor to write a paper about it. His name was Dr. Konstantin von Economo, which unbelievably isn't the name of a Marvel villain with the power to destroy the economy. He wrote about it in a paper published in the journal Wiener Klinische Hosenskrift in 1917. That's the Vienna Clinical Weekly for you non-Germans out there. And in this paper, he gave the disease a name, encephalitis lethargica, often shortened to just EL, also known as sleeping sickness. In the paper, he broke down several different types of the disease because different patients present a little bit differently, but because he was the first to publish, his name kind of stuck. So in fact, it's, it's sometimes referred to as von Economo disease. He was not the last person to publish on this disease, though, not by a long shot. The French physician René Crochet was treating patients in a military psychiatric facility, and he published descriptions of the disease very soon after von Economo. Overall, there'd be about 9,000 papers published by EL by the mid-1920s. British epidemiologist F.G. Cruikshank published a paper in 1918 that listed several other epidemics that looked a lot like EL in the past. He pointed out Germany's Kreibel Krankheit in 1672-75, Rafania in Sweden in 1754-57, and the sweating sickness in England in 1485. EL made its way to North America when the first case showed up in New York City on September 4, 1918. Within a month, three other cases were reported. EL spread quickly in the U.S. during the last half of 1918, and by the spring of the next year, it had been reported in 20 states. The disease peaked worldwide in 1923 when 2,000 people in the U.S. died from it, and literally millions around the world were infected with it. It's really about as close as you can imagine to a real-life zombie outbreak. Hundreds of thousands of people lost the ability to walk, talk, function. 
the disease spreading further and further with nothing short of global domination in sight. And then around 1925, it just kind of stopped. New cases stopped popping up, except for a few, you know, here and there. Those that had it eventually overcame the disease, went on with their lives. The whole affair was almost completely forgotten. But a few things remained. One, the question of what caused it. Two, the question of why it went away. And three, a small number of people who unfortunately just didn't get over it and remained in a catatonic limbo that went on for decades. Over the decades, doctors studied these surviving patients looking for clues to the disease's origin and pathology. And while most of it does remain a mystery, some patterns did emerge. Dr. Von Economo classified EL into three forms, amniotic, akinetic, hyperkinetic, and somnolent ophthalmoplegic. The least common of these three is amniotic, akinetic. In these cases, people experience rigidity for extended periods, but they are aware of what's happening, just their movements are very slow. As Dr. Von Economo wrote, quote, to look at these patients, one would suppose them to be in a state of profound secondary dementia. Emotions are scarcely noticeable on the face, but they are mentally intact. The hyperkinetic form presented with a manic phase at the beginning, with involuntary jerky movements in their faces, hips, and shoulders, and some vocalizations. Now that's just the first phase. After that, they experience fatigue, restlessness, and weakness, which can last for several days. And during this phase, some of them experience hallucinations and nerve pain in their faces and limbs. But the most common form was a somnolent ophthalmoplegic type of EL. Its characteristics included confusion, delirium, and feelings of being in a dazed state. Other signs are cranial nerve paralysis and an overwhelming desire to sleep. Now, one interesting link that did get made was between EL and Parkinsonism, which a lot of patients developed after the epidemic faded away. By the way, Parkinsonism is kind of a catch-all term for any neurological condition that causes stiffness, tremors, and slowed movements. So yeah, a lot of these EL patients would recover, but then later develop this kind of Parkinsonism where they'd become mentally and physically exhausted, their limbs would become rigid, their postures bent, and their walking unsteady. All of this would happen over the course of a few months. Now this isn't the same as, say, Parkinson's disease. That presents way differently. So doctors started to call it postencephalatic Parkinsonism, or PEP. Some of the differences between the two include PEP occurs at any age. Parkinson's occurs generally after age 50. PEP progresses rapidly and in spurts, Parkinson's kind of steadily progresses over time. And there's no sign of pill rolling tremors in PEP, which you often see in Parkinson's. Pill rolling tremors are these movements that make it look like you're kind of rolling a pill between your finger and your thumb. Look out, Matthew McConaughey. The majority of cases showed up during the 1920s, about six months to a year following the acute EL diagnosis. Now, some studies suggest that the number of patients with Parkinsonian symptoms actually tripled during this time. Since there were so many PEP cases in the 1920s and 30s, many doctors believed that EL caused Parkinsonism. Some even thought that Parkinsonism would disappear completely when the EL generation died out. That would have been nice, but that's not what happened. And many of them did die out over the years, many from complications from EL, many from the Parkinsonism, but some just kept on going, trapped in their faulty bodies year after year with no answer in sight. So jump ahead to the 1960s where our story began, where a small group of these survivors resided at the chronic care facility in Beth Abraham Hospital in New York. By the way, just a reminder of the timeline here, these patients had come down with this in the 20s. It was now the 1960s. So yeah, four decades had passed. Then in 1966, a new doctor came to work with these patients, a neurologist named Dr. Oliver Sachs. He had just completed a residency in neuropathology at UCLA and was interested in exploring this and other neurological edge cases that he'd read about. When he first arrived on the ward, he described it like entering a museum or a waxwork gallery. As he would later write in his book, quote, They would be conscious and aware, yet not fully awake. They would sit motionless and speechless all day in their chairs, totally lacking energy, impetus, initiative, motive, appetite, affect, or desire. They register what went on about them without active attention and with profound indifference. They neither conveyed nor felt the feeling of life. They were as insubstantial as ghosts and passive as zombies. He said there were motionless people fixed in strange positions and everything looked frozen. And that was kind of a characteristic of these patients. Like if you raised a person's arm in the air and let go, they would just kind of hold it there until you, you know, moved it back down. People basically just acted like posable figures. They really were human statues. Then in early 1967, a new treatment became available to treat Parkinson's disease. It was called levodopa or L-dopa. It works by increasing the body's ability to produce the hormone dopamine, which makes it possible for your brain to effectively transmit signals down neural pathways. And that's one of the things that is one of the root causes of Parkinson's disease. Your body stops being able to produce new dopamine and it screws up the communication signals in the brain's motor cortex. So L-dopa is a precursor to dopamine. It's a chemical your body needs to make the dopamine. So by giving Parkinson's sufferers L-dopa, it helps them to make more dopamine and that slows down the progression of Parkinson's symptoms. Sachs described it as a kind of a nutrient that serves to replace missing dopamine. Um, 
It's dopamine fertilizer, if you will. And since there's a documented connection between EL and Parkinsonism, he started to wonder if maybe it would help with EL patients too. It took a couple of years to get access to the L-DOPA and to get permission to actually test it on these patients, but finally in March of 1969, he was able to get his hands on it and he administered the L-DOPA to them. And it worked. The patients awakened and, and acted normally. These patients who had been catatonic or just straight up asleep for 40 years suddenly came to life. They were conscious, they were coherent, they were able to move and walk and play, throw balls to each other. It was like a literal miracle. Now obviously a lot of these guys were super excited to be back to their normal lives, but some actually didn't handle it very well. They, they, they would turn violent or regressed out of this transformation. They would go back into their sleepiness state. As Oliver Sacks told Fresh Air in 1985, quote, they were coming to and they were being awakened and animated, but often in a vacuum, often to a world which no longer made any sense for them, which had no place for them, in which they no longer had relatives, friends, or anything. I mean, think about it. When these guys went into this state, Charles Lindbergh hadn't crossed the Atlantic yet. And just months after they woke up, we landed on the moon. Many of them would look in the mirror and be confused by this old person staring back at them. And of course, the music and the fashion were bizarre and confusing to them. Have I been asleep this whole time? Unfortunately, after several months of being awake and experiencing life and getting to be alive again, the L-DOPA started to wear off. Each dose produced, you know, diminishing returns, and eventually they stopped responding to it altogether, and they all returned to their catatonic state. Now, if this whole story sounds familiar, it's because Oliver Sacks wrote a book about it called Awakenings, and that, of course, was turned into an Oscar-winning movie starring uh, Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. Next year will actually mark 100 years since the end of the encephalitis lethargica epidemic, and we still really have no clear idea of what caused it. But we do have some theories. Traditionally, theories have fallen into two main categories, toxological and infectious. And a third one has actually popped up in recent years, but I'll get to that in a minute. Toxicological obviously means caused by an external toxin of some kind. Um, for example, in England for a while there, it was thought that it was maybe caused by botulism or solanine uh, that can collect in potato sprouts. Now, Dr. Von Economo actually ruled out toxic causes like food poisoning early on because none of the patients had any gastrointestinal issues. He also ruled out typhoid, polio, syphilis, and poison gas. But what he did notice was that all the patients had flu-like symptoms. And since they were still coming out of the great influenza pandemic, he thought maybe it was an encephalitis created by the flu, like a, an influenza encephalitis. And there were previous instances of EL associated with flu epidemics. Unfortunately, studies showed that the brains of people who died from an influenza encephalitis had significant neuropathological differences than those who died from EL. But Dr. Von Economo still believed that an infectious virus caused EL. Now, there have been various studies that both prove and deny uh, the influenza theory, so it's, it, it's never been proven. But that would also explain why the disease suddenly went away about the same time as the influenza pandemic ended. But I did mention a third theory or hypothesis earlier, and that one was proposed in the early 2000s. It suggests that it was caused by a post-infectious autoimmune disorder. For specifically the hyperkinetic form, researchers proposed antibodies against NMDA receptors. Without getting too in the weeds, NMDA is a receptor for the neurotransmitter glutamine. It stands for N-methyl D-aspartate, and it helps with neuroplasticity. So the idea is that the body is creating antibodies that are then attacking NMDA receptors, which kind of short circuits the brain. This hypothesis was put forth by Russell Dale, a pediatric neurologist working in the UK in 2003. He was actually working with some EL patients, which by the way, plot twist, um, there are still some cases that pop up here and there today. Uh, but he was working with around 20 patients or so when he noticed that more than half of them had experienced a sore throat caused by a rare form of strep just before they started suffering from EL. And yeah, tests showed that NMDA antibodies were elevated in those patients, so he hypothesized that these antibodies may have mistakenly attacked the basal ganglia neurons. The problem is that studies that were performed during the original epidemic showed abnormalities in other parts of the brain, like the cerebral cortex. Later, in 2012, another study proposed that EL could be caused by an enterovirus, uh, maybe even the polio virus. Enteroviruses are made of RNA and protein, and they can enter the body through the gastrointestinal tract before attacking the nervous system. They can also spread through the air and uncontaminated surfaces. Anyway, the 2012 studies showed virus-like particles in the cytoplasm and nuclei of midbrain neurons in all classical EL cases studied. They also found larger virus-like particles in modern EL cases. It should be noted that none of them were influenza particles. And while it is considered a well-conducted survey, its results have not been replicated. And that basically gets us caught up to today. Um, again, lots of theories, not a whole lot of answers. It might be easy to dismiss um, encephalitis lethargica as just a weird medical mystery from 100 years ago, but I think that would be a mistake. 
After all, as I just pointed out, there are still cases that pop up from time to time, just not in the epidemic numbers that we saw way back then. Although, that might not be the case anymore. Yeah, perhaps you've noticed we've had a, a bit of a global pandemic ourselves in the last few years. And uh, yeah, we're finding an alarming trend of post-pandemic symptoms that are eerily similar to the EL epidemic. According to the CDC, 6% of the US adult population is experiencing long COVID symptoms. That's actually down from previous years, which is a good thing, but that's still nearly 20 million people. Long COVID symptoms can range from lingering loss of smell and taste to extreme fatigue and mental fog. And according to a recent study, 26.4% of COVID long haulers report significant complications in their ability to perform daily activities. Now, I, I should say right up front, long COVID is not the same as EL. Uh, there's no unresponsive human statues this time around, and the symptoms are a lot more nebulous. In fact, The Lancet published a paper in 2021 that found uh, over 200 symptoms across 10 organ systems uh, in people who experienced long COVID. Some research suggests that microclots that form around inflammatory molecules might obstruct oxygen flow into cells, and that would be why some long COVID patients feel tired, have brain fog, or can't breathe well. Another theory is that COVID-19 might uh, disrupt a mitochondrial function, which makes someone feel tired or have brain fog. But there are parallels to draw here, um, not just because it was spurred on by a, a pandemic, but because some of these nebulous symptoms I'm talking about are neurological. And it's important for us to get to the bottom of how viral infections can affect the nervous system, even years after the epidemic peaks. Or as Dr. Heidi Manji of the UK National Hospital for Neurology said, quote, let me emphasize that many of these pandemic triggering pathogens, whether directly or indirectly, exact a toll on the human's nervous system. These effects often evade timely diagnosis, but have potential to inflict significant disability and prolonged suffering. It's going to take a really long time to really understand the ripples that the COVID pandemic put into the world. Um, it's, it's kind of impossible to see it from where we're standing right now at this place in history. In fact, if the sleeping sickness teaches us anything, it's that some of the downstream effects never fully get figured out. Out of the tens of millions of people infected by the Spanish flu, a small percentage developed EL. And of those, a tiny percentage never fully recovered. It's possible that the same could be true with long COVID, and that 40 years from now, a small number of long COVID sufferers are still bedridden, hoping for a miraculous cure. My God, I hope not. For anybody out there who's dealing with long COVID symptoms, my heart goes out to you. I wish you the best, and know that... <laughs> Long COVID is not EL. Uh, don't, don't let this video freak you out too much. Totally different things. You know, researching this video has also made me wonder if there's some kind of connection with chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, you know, something else that's been around that includes extreme tiredness in people for long periods. I couldn't find anything about it, but I, I, I still wonder if there's something there. But there are a lot of unexplained epidemics like this throughout history. Like I said, I cover some of those in my Mysteries of the Human Body series over on Nebula. I encourage you to go uh, check that out. And maybe while you're watching it, you can curl up on the couch with a delicious dinner from today's sponsor, Factor. So it occurred to me that many of you haven't maybe tried out Factor at this point because you've heard me talk about it all this time. Maybe in your mind, you're thinking of the, like the frozen entrees that you get from the store, those TV dinner type things. And, and maybe that's keeping you from trying it. And if that's the case, I would like to clear up that misconception. First of all, Factor's meals aren't frozen. Okay, you don't get that weird, gross freezer burn or the weird textures like you get with frozen food. You don't have like one half of it rocket hot while the other side's frozen solid. No, this is, this is fresh food and it's packaged directly from the restaurant quality kitchen to you. In fact, if you want to compare it to something, that's really the closer comparison. Factor is kind of like ordering takeout from your favorite restaurant, except it's way less expensive. Each week you have a menu of 35 options to choose from and you can pick from a variety of meal plans to fit your needs like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, Vegan and Veggie and more. They also have gourmet options with ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini and asparagus. Yeah, it's been kind of a godsend for me because they're, they're smaller portions so there's no food wasted, there's no cleanup time, no prep time, just, just two minutes in the microwave and I'm good to go. Um, it, it basically takes away all the excuses that I come up with to eat something bad and I need all the help I can get in that department. And hey, if you do want to bite the broccolini and try it for yourself, you can use the link down below and enter the code JOESCOTT50. You'll get 50% off your first box and, wait for it, for a limited time, you'll get 20% off your next box. That's two discounted boxes, people. So take advantage of that offer by going to factor75.com or click the link below. Again, that's 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box when you enter the code JOESCOTT50. Anyway, give it a try. I think you'll be surprised.
All right, thanks so much for watching. If this is your first time here, maybe check out this video because Google thinks that it's up your alley or you can look over on the sidebar if you're on your browser. Any of those videos that have my thumbnail on it or my name on the thumbnail, whatever, uh, give them a look. And if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. Always a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members. If you are interested in supporting this channel and joining an awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe or click the little join button down below to become a member. And I'm going to leave you with that. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.